Welcome to the second session of our first QA forum of 2020. In this next segment, we'll be focusing on musculoskeletal cases. And with no disclosures to report, let's dive into our first case. This is a 21-year-old woman with knee instability. These are axial fat-suppressed fluid-sensitive sequences from an MRI of the knee. This single image from that sequence demonstrates all the pertinent findings. We have impaction injuries with associated bone marrow edema along the medial patellar facet and the lateral aspect of the lateral femoral condyle. There is at least a partial thickness tear at the patellar attachment of the medial patellofemoral retinaculum. And there is also a large lipohemarthrosis. The fat component is somewhat easier to see on this proton density sequence. This constellation of findings is consistent with transient lateral patellar dislocation. One of the things I enjoy about musculoskeletal imaging is the search for injury patterns and mechanisms of injury. In this case, the injury results from a blow to the medial aspect of the knee, resulting in lateral patellar dislocation. The impaction injuries occur when the patella moves back into its normal position and impacts against the lateral femoral condyle. The retinaculum injury results from stretching of the retinaculum during the dislocation itself. But it's always important to look for these mechanisms of injury and report them whenever possible. In this case, my report is very simple because I put all of the findings in the body of the report and my impression is simply sequelae of recent transient lateral patellar dislocation. I think that's more elegant and the orthopedic surgeons will always know what findings to look for in the body of the report. Our next case is a 17-year-old boy with pain status post-trauma. These are axial images from a CT scan of the shoulder. It's very important in musculoskeletal imaging to know what the normal anatomy is so you can look for the abnormalities. For example, in this case, there is an os acromiale, which is a normal variant often mistaken for a fracture. Always remember to review the soft tissue windows in musculoskeletal cases. The soft tissues are obviously important in and of themselves, but frequently findings that are visible on the soft tissue windows can draw your attention to osseous pathology that you may have missed on the bone windows. In this case, there is a large lipohemarthrosis. Let's review the important findings in this case. Perhaps you appreciated the small impaction injury along the anteromedial aspect of the humeral head. If you're not familiar with the normal anatomy of the proximal humerus, you might mistake this for the bicipital groove. And as I mentioned when we were scrolling through the images, there is also a large lipohemarthrosis. Had you missed the impaction injury on the bone windows, this would have alerted you to the underlying pathology. The impaction injury in this case is a reverse hill sacs lesion from a posterior glenohumeral dislocation, which is far less common than the anterior dislocations we're so used to seeing. The mechanism of injury generally is a blow to the anterior shoulder, which forces the humeral head to dislocate posteriorly. The impaction injury occurs when the humeral head moves back into its normal position and impacts on the posterior rim of the glenoid. As you can imagine, posterior labral injuries are common with this type of dislocation. As I mentioned earlier, if you're not familiar with the anatomy of the humeral head, you might mistake this injury for the normal bicipital groove. I wanted to just quickly scroll through one sequence from the follow-up MRI 
to show you how well the fat suppressed fluid sensitive sequences can bring osseous injuries like this into sharp focus. The bone marrow edema really stands out and draws your attention to the impaction injury. Of course, MRI is much more sensitive for evaluating the labrum, and as I mentioned, we see lots of labral injuries with both anterior and posterior dislocations. This next case is a 13-year-old boy status post baseball slide collided with plate. Here is the frog leg lateral view of the hip coned down. and the corresponding AP view also coned down. There is a small opacity projecting along the undersurface of the anterior superior iliac spine. This is an easy finding to miss or possibly mistake for something in the overlying soft tissues or even on the patient's clothing. But upon closer inspection, we can see a small donor site in the anterior superior iliac spine at the sartorius origin. This is, of course, a sartorius avulsion injury, which results from a forced extension of the hip. This is a good opportunity to review some of the most common pelvic avulsion injuries. I think it's very important to make all of these landmarks part of your normal search pattern when reviewing pelvic radiographs. This is the full AP radiograph from the patient we just discussed showing the sartorius injury at the anterior superior iliac spine. Just inferior to the sartorius origin is the origin of the rectus femoris at the anterior inferior iliac spine. The greater femoral trochanter is where the gluteus medius and minimus tendons insert. And the iliopsoas tendon inserts at the lesser femoral trochanter. Finally, the hamstring tendons originate at the ischial tuberosity. There are a few other important landmarks in the pelvis, for example, the abdominal muscles insert at the iliac crests, but I think if you commit these landmarks to memory, you'll catch the vast majority of pelvic avulsion injuries. I've shown this next image before, but I thought it was a nice companion case. This is a 15-year-old boy with left hip pain. Here is an AP view of the pelvis, and I think if you take a moment to review all the landmarks we just discussed, the finding will be apparent to you. Note how large the osseous fragment is in this case relative to the last one. This too is an avulsion injury at the sartorius origin. Continuing with our tour of hip avulsion injuries, let's take a look at this 59-year-old woman with left hip pain. These are axial fat-suppressed fluid-sensitive sequences from an MRI of the hip. You can ignore the hip osteoarthrosis and focus on the soft tissues. Here are the coronal fat-suppressed fluid-sensitive sequences from the same study. Again, focus your attention on the soft tissues. I think the coronal images demonstrate the finding nicely here. There is increased signal and soft tissue swelling at the origin of the rectus femoris tendon. And this is indicative of a partial thickness tear of the reflected portion of the tendon. I wanted to show this case because when we talk about avulsion injuries of the rectus femoris tendon at the anterior inferior iliac spine, we're talking about the direct portion of the tendon. 
there is also a reflected portion of the tendon which originates more superiorly along the lateral aspect of the acetabulum. Our next case is a 60-year-old man with pain. This is a lateral plane radiograph of the wrist, which demonstrates some scattered degenerative changes and dense vascular calcifications, but also some amorphous radio opacities along the volar aspect of the wrist, just proximal to the pisiform. This is consistent with hydroxyapatite deposition. As we scroll through the axial images from the follow-up CT scan, we can see that the hydroxyapatite deposition is associated with the flexor carpi ulnaris tendon fibers, which partially insert on the pisiform. The sagittal images from the same study demonstrate the anatomy very nicely. You can see the hydroxyapatite deposition in the substance of the tendon just proximal to the insertion. This is a case of flexor carpi ulnaris calcific tendinopathy. If you know the imaging appearance, you should be able to make this diagnosis on plane radiography. Next, let's take a look at a 49-year-old man with localized swelling and mass times five months. Here is a coned down PA radiograph of the middle finger and the corresponding oblique view. You can all no doubt appreciate the globular radio opacities and the soft tissues along the volar radial aspect of the proximal interphalangeal joint. Notice how smoothly marginated these are relative to the hydroxyapatite deposition we saw in the last case. Let's scroll through the T1-weighted sequence to see what this finding looks like on MRI. And now the sagittal fat suppressed fluid sensitive sequence. Finally, let's take a look at the axial fat suppressed fluid sensitive sequences. Note that the finding is hypointense on all sequences. Reviewing the findings, we have globular hypointensity along the volar radial aspect of the third finger. There is associated soft tissue swelling and synovitis. and the subjacent flexor tendon is grossly normal in appearance. The diagnosis here is tumoral calcinosis, which is a rare hereditary disorder resulting in periarticular soft tissue calcifications throughout the body. It is much more frequently seen in larger joints like the hip, shoulder, and elbow, but here we have a nice case of it in the middle finger. Let's take a look at one more case before we close out this segment. This is a 50-year-old man with left shoulder pain and an injury three months ago. These are axial fat-suppressed fluid-sensitive sequences from an MRI of the shoulder. And again, these sequences are really terrific for looking at bone marrow and soft tissue edema. I'll draw your attention to the supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscle bellies. Here are the corresponding coronal images, 
And finally, the sagittal sequence, which I think really demonstrates the findings beautifully. We'll use an image from that sequence to have a closer look at our findings. There is prominent edema in the supraspinatus muscle belly. and similar findings in the infraspinatus muscle belly. Intramuscular edema in and of itself is a nonspecific finding, but when you see this pattern of involvement, specifically the supraspinatus and infraspinatus muscle bellies, I want you to think of Parsonage-Turner syndrome, especially in this case where we have a history of subacute trauma. When you see these two muscle bellies involved, it's generally the suprascapular nerve that is affected. In some cases, you will also see deltoid muscle involvement, and in those cases, it is the axillary nerve that is involved as well. This concludes the second segment of our QA forum. I hope you'll join me for the next segment where I will talk about some of the common imaging findings we see with COVID-19 pneumonia.